Okay. Um, so I think what I would say about um, getting questions about uh, about feeding animals and composting, and I think what I would say about that is that you'll want to be careful about having animals see your yard as a food source. And that's true in general, whether or not you're composting there, because increasingly we're starting to see bears here in Chittenden County and bears come around when they think that there is food to be found there. So what we often hear is that bears are only a problem for, uh, with, um, for people who have compost piles if they're are already doing things that are likely to attract bears. Compost piles on their own are not necessarily going to mean that you have bears coming from far and wide. But if you leave your bird, uh, bird feeder out all summer, which is not advised by Vermont Fish and Wildlife, then bears know that there's food there and then they may start to take an interest in your compost and other things around your house, maybe your, maybe your back door. Um, and so that's the reason why we would advise not feeding animals uh, right in your yard. Um, there, there, are also, there are also good reasons to secure your compost pile um, in general like the fact that um, there are fungi sometimes that can make a dog sick if a dog gets into your compost pile and so forth. So we'd always suggest securing your pile um, so it keeps critters out and um, avoiding bringing animals to your yard for food if you can. Um, Ethan, if, if I can just jump in one, yes. one other thought on that. Not everyone is aware, I don't think, if your solution to, to handling food scraps is to compost at home, and we all know, we know that there are certain things you can't put in a backyard compost pile like meat and bones and dairy. You are still allowed under, under the new law, you are still allowed to put those things in your trash. So while there's, there's a ban on putting food scraps into the trash, if your solution only covers, you know, 90% of the food scraps you generate and the, the remaining 10% can't go into your your backyard pile, which is your primary solution, you are still allowed to throw those away. Um, so you don't have to come up with a different solution for those items. You can, you can still bring them to us um, uh, or have them picked up, but you are allowed to throw them away if, um, if you are handling the rest of your food scraps uh, through a backyard compost pile. And we'll talk more about, um, thank you, Robin. We'll talk more about um, backyard composting guidance and so forth. Um, but um, the part, part of the reason not to put meat and bones in your backyard pile is because uh, meat tends to attract scavengers more um, that can be more aggressive critters um, and also can be more likely to od uh, odors and also pathogens. So, um, so for all the reasons why you wouldn't probably want to put meat and bones in your backyard compost, you probably also would not want to put them in, in your yard for, for animals. Um, I'm seeing a question about a, a vacuum sealed container and whether there's any downside to that. Um, that's a great question. In the sh in short term, no. Like if you're um, for your countertop, I think that's just fine um, because you're going to be emptying it frequently. Which the reason why you might not want a, a vacuum sealed container um, if you're going to be leaving them there for a long time is because you are creating anaerobic conditions. No oxygen is getting in, which means that, and it's in those under those conditions that uh, food waste really starts to to stink. Um, so that's why often if you left it in a you know in a five gallon bucket or something, and then when you take that lid off, it can be really rank. Um, it's because it is decomposing in anaerobic conditions. So. That's why some countertop buckets do have um, like a, a porous lid with a carbon filter in it so that the carbon filter um, uh, mitigates the odors, but it's still allowing air to get the material. Again, I don't think that's a big deal for a few days, but if you're gonna have it sit around for a couple of weeks, you probably do want to make sure you have a, a setup that's gonna allow air to get in there. Okay, moving on. Um, so we just we're breaking down in this slide into obviously pick up and drop off and then what you can do at home and backyard composting is what's most well known, but you can also backyard digest and we'll talk a little about distinction is there. Um, so, oops, 
We sell um, a couple of products, one backyard composting product and one digesting product. That's the soil saver for composting and the green cone for digesting. Um, the, the main difference is that a composter produce, produces compost, that you pull something out of it, material out of it, that then you add to your garden and enhances your garden. A digester just makes your food scraps disappear into the ground. Um, so you do not harvest from it. It's just, it can make the um, soil around them richer because of the nutrients that are being flushed into the soil, but you don't, you don't harvest any product out of it. And therefore there's not as much to do um, in processing it. You don't have to maintain a, a recipe or a ratio. You don't need to turn it. You just throw your food scraps into your digester and um, let it do its thing. As you see, the soil saver is, is that's what you're, um, let me, soil saver is what you're seeing right there on the left. And that's just a very basic um, container. It doesn't even have a floor, just a lid. And you can either put it on the ground um, on the earth or on something like a piece of plywood or um, even something like asphalt. Um, a soil saver has to be turned by hand. You have to reach in with a shovel and turn the material, um, which is in contrast to tumbler products where you can turn a crank or rotate the whole unit um, to turn it. And therefore you don't need a, to do as much manual labor with the shovel. Um, the downside is that tumblers are often a little bit smaller and tend to cost more because they, they do have, there's more to them. Um, you can make your own um, three bin system out of pallets or cinder blocks or what have you. It doesn't even have to be three bay. It can be two bay or even one bay system. And then some people reuse containers like 50 gallon drums and turn those into composters. Um, there's actually a, a gentleman up in the Champlain Islands. Uh, I don't know if he's still doing it, but for years he was turning 50 gallon drums into tumblers by putting them on a, um, an axle and, um, and cutting a hole in them and so forth. Um, so great, great example of reuse um, to make a do-it-yourself uh, composter. The green cone is by far the most common type of digester. Um, and that's the product we sell. The home biogas too is a much more advanced digester because it actually uh, captures the methane that is produced. And then there are some um, instructions on the internet and what have you for how you can make a digest yourself, essentially by sinking a, uh, a trash can or something like that into the ground where it has holes in it um, through which the, the liquid portion of the food waste can, um, can leach out and into the soil. Um, the, in addition to the fact that you don't get anything out of a digester, the other big difference is that you're not putting yard waste into a digester. Backyard, backyard composting involves uh, blending food scraps with leaves or other yard waste to get the right ratio. A digester not only doesn't need the right ratio, but will not break down things like leaves. So um, if you're looking to get rid of leaves and uh, yard waste as well as your food waste, then probably a composter is a better way to go. Ethan, if I yes. could chime in with just one other difference is that in digest, digesters will take all of your food scraps, including meat and bones and dairy, things that wouldn't go into a compost system in your backyard. So while on the one hand, it takes all of your food scraps, on the other hand, that's the only thing it takes. It doesn't take other, other stuff that you might be wanting to get rid of like leaves and grass that you mowed and things like that. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Depends much part on what, what you eat and what kind of yard you have and what kind of waste you're, organic waste you're trying to manage. That's a great point. My only word of caution there is that bones, whether they're in a composter or a digester are not really gonna um, break down very quickly at all. It's gonna take years. And so a lot of bones in a digester are just gonna fill up your digester. Um, the other thing that some people see as a benefit to a digester is that some people use it for pet waste. Um, and the, the main reason why you can do that is because you're not pulling it back out. So it's, um, you're not going to be handling it again. We don't advise putting um, uh, cat or dog feces in a composter because of the risk of pathogens. Just some examples, some more examples of these um, different kinds of bin setups. So you see a three bin system on um, upper left and a cinder block system in the upper right. Um, the, the one in the lower right is just some, a compost or somebody that's made out of a, a trash can. And um, it's a similar way that you would make a, a green cone, but you would sink that into the ground um, up to, you know, sink 
at like three feet into the ground with plenty of holes in it. And then in the lower left is a, um, a homemade um, composter using solar heat to get it a little hotter to expedite the process. So using an old storm door, nice reuse um, so that it will heat up faster in there and expedite the process. And then tumblers also come in a, a variety of forms. Um, again, a little bit more expensive because they're a little bit more complicated. Um, so upper left is uh, called a Yura and that actually has um, foam insulation in it. So it's designed to sort of be stay warm um, more of the year and therefore be effectively composting for more of the year. Um, there's a spherical tumbler where you just roll it around. Upper right is a, you're seeing only half. It's sort of a half of the clamshell um, style uh, tumbler that's on a retail shelf. And then obviously a, other styles along the bottom. And we are sort of um, getting to the end here. Um, and I see I have a question. So I'll, I'll cover that before we jump into sort of the some final considerations. Um, smell associated with a digester. In my experience, digesters, um, they certainly smell in them, but the, the odors really do um, get sequestered pretty well in the digester and don't, um, so you can be standing pretty close to right over it and not smell it in a green cone. Um, it's been my experience. Um, I compost, uh, composter is a little different in that if you're doing it right in terms of the ratio, um, it tends not to smell because you're keeping it, you're getting a plenty of oxygen um, and the right, the right materials so that your critters are happy and um, then it smells earthy more than smelly. Um, obviously that's not true of the fresh food scraps when they're going in, but once you've mixed them in and if you have the right ratio and plenty of oxygen, um, you shouldn't expect your compost to smell. Okay. Um, just to, to hit on these points, a lot of people, one of, one of the things I hear a lot is that people don't realize how much food they waste until they're, until they're separating their food scraps. And I, that makes sense. Um, you know, we just don't, we just sort of lose track of how much it adds up unless you're sort of seeing it visually as you do when you have a separate container on your countertop for it. You can keep track by how many times a week you have to run it out to your, you know, um, backyard container or, or bin. Um, so it's just using that as feedback about what's going bad, you know, what you're not able to keep up with. And maybe you can share that with a neighbor um, or, you know, what kind of leftovers are, are you losing track of in the fridge and so forth. Um, there are also various ways that you can put your scraps to use so that you're, um, they're not scraps. Maybe they're useful um, in, as ingredients. One of the um, other things that I like to promote is the idea of that you don't have to go with one of these options. You can decide that you're going to try your hand at backyard composting, but if it doesn't seem to be going well, or if it fills up and it's no, you're not keep you're generate too fast, then you could just do drop off until you know until the weather changes or until your backyard setup is caught up. Or what have you? I, I think that drop off um, that because wintertime composting is so challenging, and a lot of piles, most piles, just become frozen solid. I think wintertime is a great time to to do drop off composting, especially because you can go longer between drop offs without your food scraps smelling. You know, they'll just stay frozen or um, cold outside, and so you can just go whenever you need to go, and and not feel like you need to go as frequently as you do in the summer when they're going to get really rank. You can um, source other materials to help your backyard composting or even to top off your bins so you don't have to smell them from local businesses. Coffee shops in particular always have a lot of food waste that they can't put in the trash that they need to um, send for composting or something like that. Um, and they'll usually be happy to let you fill up, you know, five gallon bucket or something with that and take it off their hands to use on your compost pile. And one of the ways that you can um, deal with odors that way is, is by putting like an inch or two of coffee on top of your food scraps that are going to be sitting around for a while. And then that tamps down the odors and keeps them from leaking out and you're going to just smell the coffee. So um, they also can make uh, add can do nice things for a backyard compost bin as part of your mix too, because obviously they don't need to do a lot of decomposing. And then you can experiment too. Um, some things are gonna be just more stubborn foods. Uh, I don't try to compost avocado um, pits 
anymore seeds avocado seeds um because they just they they look just like they coming out just like they did going in um and there are other things like that and of course meat and bones which you don't suggest putting in your backyard bin so you can either experiment with small quantities or you can do some drop-off composting for that kind of stuff um and and sort of figure out what you're willing to be patient and wait for it to compost and what is not worth it to you and you'll just have done through the more industrial um, composting process that we have at Green Mountain Compost. And then I did promise that we'd make some of this about how to take advantage of the winter time and, and what considerations um, there are in winter when it comes to composting. Some people will tell you that they can keep their pile going through the winter and um, and that's true, but the, the biggest key to that is a large pile and usually larger than any kind of uh, commercial container you're going to get. So if you're really going to be that determined and it's going to take some work, um, then you probably want to do make your own setup, like a three bay um, pallet system or something like that. Um, because you're going to need, we usually say at least a four by four by four foot pile in order to have the critical mass to retain the inner heat during the winter. Um, if you do that, there's obviously a lot of other stuff we can talk about as far as um, strategies, try to keep your compost going. Um, but probably um, for most people, what's more realistic is just to know that your compost is going to go dormant over the winter. And so you're going to need a little bit more space. You might need a second container because it's not going to be breaking down. So it's just going to build up over the winter. And then you might need to, to start using a second container. So winter time tends to be when I know whether I have enough capacity for my food scraps or not. Um, the other thing um, is that you can um, as we already talked about, go longer between your trips and take advantage of drop-off um, composting, which can be a, a very nice convenience in the winter instead of having to fight your frozen pile or trudge out to it. Um, compostable liners can be a good um, way to keep stuff from sticking to your um, containers. And I, um, I don't know how, how well compostable liners do if they get wet and whether they're still likely to, to stick, but you can always use a combination of things. So you could put a little bit of paper um, on the outside around your uh, food scraps or use a couple of liners um, and have one that stays in your bin and the other that just that the food scraps come out in. Um, but uh, paper will also do that. Even any sort of loose material um, that's compostable can work too. So even some sawdust or leaves can keep your uh, food scraps from sticking. And uh, most um, innovative that we've heard is nonstick cooking spray. So in the video, you saw that um, spray your buckets and then you have less um, rinsing out, but it's also a way that if, if things are freezing to keep your stuff from freezing to the side such that you can still knock it out. Um, I see a question. I'll speak more to the ratio near backyard composting. Sure. So again, backyard composting doesn't have to be really complicated, but if you want to avoid odors, you really want to be putting um, a lot of yard waste in to complement your food scraps. So we call leaves brown material and food scraps are quote unquote green material. And you really want three times as many, as many leaves or browns as greens um, in, your, um, in your backyard bin. So you wanna, you wanna mix it uh, frequently, um, meaning like weekly or every couple of weeks um, and maintain that ratio, meaning to have some leaves nearby that you can add as you are um, adding food scraps. And if you don't have leaves, you can use things like sawdust or even cardboard can work as a brown on shredded paper. Any other questions? Okay. Um, this just illustrates the, th this is a decision tree, you know, that you can choose, look at what you have to compost or what you have to manage, I should say. Um, and whether it is, um, you know, are you gonna have a lot of meat and bones and you are gonna wanna be able to, to deal with those? Well, then you could do a digester if you're doing it at home or in general, having somebody else manage your compost is, is gonna be better for, for meat and bones. Um, and you see that um, if you do pick up, it's through private haulers, drop off, it could be at a farm, more likely it'll be at one of our um, drop off centers. And, and as an indoor option, there's always worms. And we do offer workshops. Uh, Recycle Rhonda offers workshops on how to worm compost at home.
just again, illustration of the different options. And in table form, sort of presenting cost versus the time commitment and what, what can be included. Um, as you see, worms, um, worms are very efficient, but they are a little bit more fussy about what they take. So that's one downside of worms. And then at farms will depend on the farmer. You know, that's gonna be very much by arrangement with the, the farmer. Um, so can't really speak to cost or what they'll take, but generally, um, generally most farms will take all food scraps if, if they're interested in taking um, food waste at all. Any other questions? Robin, what am I forgetting? I think you covered everything really. There's, you know, the two big options are at home or away. If you're doing it at home, you've got backyard composting. And if you want more information on, um, to get more into the technical details on that, we offer webinars that are just about backyard composting. We'll talk about all the, all you need to know about the ratios and what to put in and how to mix it and the types of containers, all that stuff. Um, and then for away options, you can either bring it to us yourself or you can hire somebody to do that work for you. And uh, that's, that's really the nutshell. Great. Um, so uh, we haven't talked too much about what can be included, but if you can eat it, it can, it can be included in commercial composting. As we talked about backyard composting, there are a few other considerations, whether, whether um, it's meat and bones, um, breaking it down finer if it's gonna be really kind of stuff that's stubborn. Um, but for commercial composting, um, plain old paper used to line your bin um, and coffee filters and anything that you can eat, um, even stuff that's part of food you can't eat, like peels, shells, seafood shells, and so forth is commercially compostable. So um, you can bring it for drop off or put it in your, your bin um, if it's being picked up. Great. Well, I won't keep everybody, um, but thank you again for joining us. Oh, we got one more question just popped in here. Oh, it's a thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming as well. Yes, thank you all. So um, this recording will be available. Um, we'll make sure South Burlington Rec has it to distribute. Um, we'll also put it up on our um, uh, YouTube. Um, and we are always available and happy to answer questions about um, food scrap options in general, backyard composting, and so forth. So reachable on our hotline, um, 8.30 to 2.30, Monday through Friday, or reach out by email. Thanks again, folks. Good night, everybody.